I think highly of myself and I became greedy and also angry. I think I can do everything with my business. That's why I make mistake. I also went to Goenga Center that make me encourage because he can change his life from a businessman to a successful meditation teacher. I use the power of mindfulness and detachment. If I am thinking of myself, I can do only with limit. But if I am thinking of doing what is good and continues the practice in my daily life, I can be what I want. I can solve many problems of the people in the society. They are trying to close the center, but the monks cannot accept that idea because they know many people in the center have no place to go. So if they close the center and drive them away, they are sure to die. You're about to hear an extended interview with the Bawa Sayada, and I'm thrilled that we can bring it to you. The Burmese abbot keeps an extremely busy schedule, packing more into a day than 20 other Sayadas can do in a week. So just being granted an audience is no small feat in itself. In fact, we had been in touch in prior weeks with others at the Bawa Monastery about the possibility of him stopping by, but it was touch and go for a while. Then we suddenly got a message that very morning that Sayada would agree to come at 11 p.m. in the evening. An intensive day of preparation and several late night cups of coffee later, he showed up at midnight with an entourage of about eight nuns in tow. The studio was only large enough for three to join, so those who spoke English sat on the floor beside Sayada for the duration of the interview. The rest sat cross-legged in meditation outside the studio for the duration of the discussion, which was not over until about four o'clock in the morning. Just several days prior to our talk, Sayada had flown back from London after an extended European tour. And only a few hours after we finished, he was driven to the Yangon airport en route to do a meditation retreat he was going to be leading in Vietnam. The four prior days in the country, he had spent in constant movement between Tan Lien, Yangon, Mandalay, and Pa'an. Demands on his time are so strenuous that he fills his night hours with tasks that cannot be put into his daily schedule simply for lack of time. You might expect a person like this who was always moving, meeting so many people with such diverse demands, and being asked to take decisions on so many important matters, to have something of a full mind when you finally sit down. I know for myself, if I have a plane flight planned just a week in advance, I already start getting tense preparing for what I need to have in order. And yet, during the four hours we spent talking, Sayada gave his full and complete attention, showing no signs of tiredness and was thoughtful to the myriad questions that were coming his way. After the talk, several of the nuns were delighted about the path the conversation had taken, noting that they had rarely heard Sayada speak so extensively about his upbringing and earlier life. This is not to say that we're anywhere near done with the discussion. 
The subject of Sayyidah's biography and development is critical to gaining a deeper understanding for how Tabawa has developed in recent times. And so this first podcast is devoted exclusively to the topic. In future talks, we'll draw on this background when examining the current mission and the activity of Tabawa. In other words, this is the first of several more to come. Personally speaking, perhaps the most impressive part of meeting Tabawa Sayeda is how detached he truly seems. In spite of his worldwide stature and fame, a fact that gives way to even some religious leaders gaining ego, his humility, patience, and gentleness still permeate every interaction from start to finish. You don't feel any hidden agenda lurking behind the words, but rather an intention to empty his own mind as thoroughly as possible so as to give you, the interlocutor, free reign in shaping the conversation according to your needs. Although this talk was more a questioning of his own life and background, you can only imagine how many other disciples use these interactions to pour out their own problems and fears. That said, let me get out of the way and turn the rest of the episode over to Tabawa Sayeda. I hope you enjoy listening to this talk as much as I did having it. Okay, so I'm joined by the Bawa Sayeda, and thank you so much for being here with us today. My pleasure. And to set the scene, so uh, we're in Yangon, and it's about midnight um, when you arrived. We heard that you were in the Yangon area, and we uh, were very hopeful you might join us, and we feel very privileged and blessed that you did make time for us. We found out just earlier today that you might have some free time uh, around 11 or 12 uh, tonight. So we thought that was worth staying up for, and we're very happy that you were able to join us. And um, I think this is also a time to talk about your schedule, that I think it's not very common that we would try to speak to a Sayada and the only available time he had would be 11 or 12 o'clock. So I'm curious a little bit about um, the, the schedule that you keep. I have been traveling around the world for recent three years continuously. I really stay in the center, in the country. If I stay in the center, there are many visitors, so I have to accept their donation and this time about cause and effect of doing good deeds and then share merits Especially in holidays, people are crowded in the center. So I cannot go out in daytime. Only at about 10 o'clock at night, I'm free. No, no more visitor. So I have to go out for teaching at 10 o'clock or midnight. Sometimes nearly the whole night, I have to teach from one house to another or one hospital to another. So I have to, when I was travel, I have to travel at night and then at daytime, I continue teaching. Sometimes even at midnight, I have to teach to the people because I was traveling continuously and there are also many people who are invited to their place. In some, some time, I cannot arrive there at daytime. So I have to arrive their place at midnight and I started teaching. So it, it used to happen like this for over three years continuously. So how do you get your sleep? <laughs> Most of the time, I have to sleep in the car. Uh-huh. How, how many hours a day do you usually sleep? If I am feeling well, 
uh, about three hours uh, or four hours. If I'm not feeling well, I will sleep about five or six hours. And how do you keep your energy level with doing all the activities you do with so little sleep every day? Because of the belief and support and welcome, warmly welcome of the people who invite us. Uh, because we are also traveling by group, sometimes over 100 people. So we, uh, we can do many things by traveling together continuously. We can teach them how to do goodies together at their place, at their country. From 2014, the fate or condition of the power center changed totally. More and more people are willing to support us, to volunteer, to donate, to do goodies together with us. That's why, although I am restless, 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 I'm satisfied, and also they are satisfied to meet with me, to learn from me, uh, to donate what they want. So I can survive like this. And that's also why we really greatly appreciate the time that you've made for us today coming here, knowing how much you're doing before and how much you're doing after. So I think the question many people would have hearing your schedule and everything you pack in a day, the level of responsibility you have. And I should say that you arrived here at midnight, very calm, very relaxed. Uh, you mentioned that you weren't feeling well, but you seem very strong and uh, present in your answers. And so I think a question people would have is how are you able to combine such a high level of activity and constant movement and responsibility and decision making hour after hour, day after day with so little sleep and to still maintain this presence of mind and body? Because of meditation practice, I can successfully detach from myself. That's why I don't need to think of myself too much. I just need to think of doing what is good. If I have a chance, I have a chance to do what is good, I will try to do it. But not only for me, but also for the others. From 2007, the time when the first Dabawa Center established, I emphasize on teamwork. That is really effective for the people to, to know the truth, to get best result for what they want. If they want to be healthy, they can be healthy. If they want to long life, they can be long life. If they want to have good business, they can have because of doing good deeds together. I grew up in the city. I meditate in the city. So I have many experience about the life of the people in the city. That's why I can solve many problems of the people in the city for shelter, food, job, health care, family problems also. I use the power of mindfulness and detachment. If I am thinking of myself, I can do only with limit. But if I am thinking of doing what is good and continues the practice in my daily life, I can be what I want. I can solve many problems of the people in the society. From the age of 10 years old, I, I stay in Yangon up to now. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit about your family and upbringing and childhood? My father was mining engineer. My mother was a shopkeeper uh, at one of the famous markets in Yangon. So my mother emphasized on business. My father emphasized 
on education for me i i don't want to get rich i want to be an educated person when i was young besides i love freedom i don't want to work for government like my father because most of the government servants are not free there is limit whatever they do so i want to be a doctor and i want to help the people who are sick but i cannot go to the medical university because my father was not citizen shit myanmar citizenship oh where was he from she is from china your father was from china my my mother your mother was from china from mainland Bo- china both are from china but oh, I see. they are they they are born both my father and mother uh, were born in myanmar uh-huh. but they are my grandfather and grandmother are from china I see so although both your parents were born in Myanmar because their parents had immigrated from China yes. they didn't have proper citizenship and that yeah, prevented yeah. you from pursuing your dreams at medical school. Yes, right. Mm, right. Yeah, so what did you do instead? That's why I chose English major at the university. I also intend to be a teacher. Right. A private teacher. Mm-hmm. Because I love teaching also. because of the conflict between me and my parents especially with my mother my father is a government officer so he is moving from one place to another when i move to yangon i have to stay with my mother right so i have to help with her business after a few years of business experience with her i started to open a small convenience store right. at, at home at what age were you when you did this after i passed then standard right about 1960 68 my mother wanted me to go to japan uh-huh. at that time because many people in the country they went abroad for job because the business in the country is not good economically this was a very difficult time in Myanmar yes but i don't want to go to other country for many so i love education i want to continue my education that there's the there's the conflict between me and Uh, my parents your parents wanted you to go to japan to yes. make better money and you yes. wanted to stay in myanmar and and yes. teach was it yes right yes but and it sounds like it was resolved by opening a business in myanmar a convenience store yes because i i'm not willing to go to other country for job uh-huh. uh, because that is not much not much key in japan if we are not educated we have to work at the food store or at the right still today this happens there's many poor burmese that end up in japan korea singapore working yes. very difficult jobs in factories and yeah. uh making maybe better salaries but also very difficult working conditions and not able to save much money yes, so yes. so it sounds like instead you stayed in myanmar at a time where there weren't many economic possibilities and somehow you became somewhat of a successful entrepreneur even in a very difficult financial environment. That's right. Yeah. Right. Because I choose to stay in the country and then I try to open a convenience store at the house and I learn a new business for me. Uh, but my mother was not much patient to do like this uh-huh. because there are many things we sell many small things uh-huh. uh, at the store so he they don't like it right but i continues doing like this and why did they not like it because they are not used to do like this they're not in the business field yes uh, they they sell cigarette uh-huh uh, at the market 
So it is easy, not much thing to do. Right. But for a convenience too, there are many things, uh, many household goods and medicine also. So it made them disappointed. They have to, they are busy right. for buying, for selling. Right. We have to sell many small things. Mm -hmm. So if I'm not, if I was not at home, they have to sell and that's also the, they don't like. So although it was your business, because your family was behind you, it became something of a family business and they had to get involved to help you run it. And it sounds like yes. it was a lot of work for them. Yes, yeah. yes, because they, me, they are old also. Right. They are old and not like me. I'm young, so right. I can do many things. Uh, that's why in 1993, uh -huh. I decided to leave the house and the family to run my own business. Uh -huh. this, so this was a new business you started after the convenience store? At the same convenience store, but uh -huh. at new place. Right. And I have, to, I have to rent a new place in the main road. And then I started my own business by myself with one of the staff. Right. Did you have any business training or experience? No. Right. And it's interesting to say, you know, now that Myanmar has opened up, there's a lot of new businesses coming out in the last five years. But before Myanmar opened in 2012, the business environment was very difficult. It was very, very difficult without connections and without experience to go into the entrepreneurial field. Yes, at the time, not much uh, supermarket, uh, only a few supermarket. Right. No, the business is not good and really difficult to get success. But in my view, I'm not satisfied with myself because mm -hmm. as, a, as a man, as an educated person, I'm not doing something as much as I went. Right. To stay with my family is not free. Mm. That's why I decided to take risks, to take risks. To start your own business. Yes, yes. And so did you feel, if you were feeling a lack of freedom with your family up until 1993, did you feel some sense of freedom and independence when you started this business by yourself? Sure. But it's, it is really dangerous also yeah. because I was alone. So I have to rely on myself because I run my own business. That's why I'm free. Mm -hmm. I can do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. I have to make decisions all, all the time. Sure. So that is really good training mm -hmm. for me to be a real practitioner in business. Sure, yeah. Most of the people here don't have that, that chance. They are under the control of their parents or teacher because they will not run away from the house and family. They stay together. They are controlling each other. So what you did was very unusual to go yes, out yes, on yes. your own as an yes. island and strike out with just your own skills and wit yes, yes. and ability and sink or swim. That was something in other Western countries, this might not be so unusual, but here this is not an experience that many people have. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. People think I will get into trouble because I made against with my bearings. Uh, besides, I'm alone. So I may get married or uh, I may lose in my business. People think like this. But I decided uh, to take risks, whatever happened. That's why I have courage sure. to lose my life. Mm -hmm. I will not go back to the family, even if I lose uh, in my business, I will, I have to 
encourage myself to do like this because it is unusual in this country. Right. Did you have good relations with your family? After I started meditation, we became united again. Right. But it, it sounds like when you struck out on your own in 1993, the relations maybe were a little difficult at that time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, no more connection is other. Right. So you were not just on your own financially and in terms of business, but it sounds like emotionally and psychologically, you were also somewhat on your own at that time. Yes. Right. So from 1993, you started this business and then take us through how the business grew and how uh, you did as an entrepreneur. In the beginning, I don't have enough finance, so I have to borrow from one of my cousin for my business. Maybe after a few months, I can give back. Because I'm free and I'm not strange with business, so I can do many things in my own business. Right. So it developed quickly. So it was successful. Yes. Right. It developed quickly and uh, I can sell many things, many okay. new things. Right. Uh, even the clogs, watch, watch or clogs, and also clothes, clothes. It's it's changed to be a small mini market. So, the business was doing well from 1993, and it sounds like you were having some measure of success. And how did that make you feel? I can buy an apartment at Thirty Eighth Street, nineteen ninety eight. I can, I can extend my business by my friends. They want to share. Uh, they want to put share, and they want to invest in my business mm-hmm. because there is success in my own business. So the many people rely on me. That make me proud of myself. Mm-hmm. That is the biggest problem. I see. Because it is very real to get success like this within uh, five years. I cannot control my mind. Ah. That, that is the beginning of facing with problems in my business. What, when you say you can't control your mind, what was happening that you couldn't control? I'm, I think highly of myself. And... I'm, I'm becoming greedy mm-hmm. and also angry. Mm-hmm. I, I think I can do everything mm-hmm. with my business. That that's why I make mistake. I see. Uh, because I'm not thinking of the others uh, because of ignorance, greed, and anger. In my mind, I cannot believe my mind at that time because it changed a lot. As a child, I'm not much greedy and angry. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as a businessman, I became greedy and I want to make manufacturer to produce my own products. But at that time, there was problems in my business. Some of the things are stolen, but I cannot find out the person concerned. That make me, besides, I make mistake by accusing one of the staff mm. as a thief. Mm-hmm. But when I make that mistake, I came to understand that that is wrong mm-hmm. because of his response. But I cannot find who is the person concerned. That make me disappointed mm-hmm. with myself. I need to learn more. I'm not complete yet. That is right view. Right. So it sounds like the rapid success of your business led to a destabilization of mind, uh, an unbalance of mind that itself led to the business not doing well 
and making mistakes with that unbalanced mind. And uh, at this time, had you had any experience with meditation or with Dhamma? Had you had any contact? No. Hmm. But after facing with difficulty in my business, I have chance uh, to go to one of the meditation retreat. And I should ask your your background. What was your parents' religion? Uh, traditional Buddhism. Okay, so they were from, although they were from China, because they were born in Myanmar, they were they yes, were raised why? with a traditional Burmese sense of of Buddhist identity and practice. Yes, Burma is Buddhist country. That's right. why people who stay here. Uh, they have to believe in Buddhism. So your parents adopted the local yes, custom yes. as they came, right? So you had a traditional religious Buddhist background, but maybe not a deeper touch um, yes. with the Dhamma. So you were familiar with the concepts, but not with the actual practice, it sounds like. I was invited to one of the five days meditation retreat. Mm -hmm. My manager is interested in religion. That's why I decided to go together. What year was the retreat? Uh, your 1999. So your first met it. So just to track the days, the 93 was when you struck out on your own with business. 98 was where you achieved some measure of success, but then started to also decline due to the unbalanced mental state. And then 99 was when you took your first meditation course. Yes. Right. And what tradition was that? Mogok. Mogok. Mm -hmm. I have to learn from the old monk who is teaching, who has been teaching Mogo Medak for many years. He is teaching not only by works, but also by practice. He is not underestimated. He did not underestimate me because although I, I was young and new, to the meditation center. He treated me as impermanent nature. Mm -hmm. We are the same. Right. No I, no you, no, not U, not Gyan, mm -hmm. not Monk, not Le person, just ever new impermanent nature. He treated me like that at the first uh, meeting mm -hmm. with him. That made me amazed. Mm. Because in the society, I have never experienced like this. I heard about impermanent nature, uh, a nature, dukkha, another, but just what? Not practice. Only at the meditation center, I have to experience by myself, the practice of the ultimate truth. In the beginning of my practice, I'm not successful. I cannot sit, stay even for five minutes. Mm -hmm. I have to keep reset. But because of my own experience, I like to keep reset. Although I'm not much careful to keep reset, I am satisfied to practice mindfulness or meditation, although I am not skillful. My own experience makes me satisfied to continue the practice right. more and more. One thing I find interesting in hearing your story is that there's parallels to two other great Burmese meditation teachers. You talk about working in the marketplace uh, earlier in your life, and that reminds me of Sayada Utejaniya, who also came from a market background and talks about his experiences of uh, practicing mindfulness in a very busy marketplace. And you also came out of that. And then you come to talking about feeling disillusioned and um, mentally unbalanced due to your business activity. And of course, that reminds me of SN Gwenka who famously went to his first meditation course because of a terrible migraine that nothing would cure. So it's interesting thinking about these parallels that you had with at least two other biographies of other great meditation teachers that came from this country. Yes. I also went to 
going to center. So that make me encourage mm -hmm. because he can change his life from a businessman to a successful meditation teacher. Right. So that story identified, you identified with his experience of yes. being a, a businessman with too much stress and learning how to come out of it through meditation. Yes. Right. So it sounds like you had had this traditional Burmese Buddhist experience, but never really touching the Dhamma in a profound way that was life-changing until this five-day Mogok course in 1999. So take us through the next several years of what, what was your, your experience with meditation, with Dhamma, with teachers during this time, and how did this affect you and your business and your life and your psychology? Because of my own experience about meditation, I became interested in Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. Mm -hmm. Seriously. Right. That's why in 2000, April, during Wada Festival, I ordained. It just took a very short time from your first Mogok course to wanting to ordain. And then what other types of meditation courses did you go to? No more meditation groups. Uh, for four months because I don't meditate at home after coming back from my first day meditation retreat. Uh -huh. uh, but first meditation retreat is not full time. I just go about one hour listening meditation, one hour listening the motto and one hour Practicing meditation only. Uh -huh. I don't sleep at a meditation center. Mm -hmm. uh, but I cannot forget about my own experience about meditation. I like that experience. I like to meditate, to keep reset, to use my life for Dhamma or meditation. Mm -hmm. That made me decide to ordain as a monk for five days. So in 2000, your ordination was temporary? Yes, only five days. I see, I see, right. The first ordination in my life. I see, so it's traditional in Burmese Buddhist society to ordain when you're younger as a child, so yes. you never had that experience? Yes, at, when I was young, I'm, I was not interested mm -hmm. to ordain, mm. so I reject uh, to ordain. Why were you not interested? Because I'm not... I'm not interested in religion. Right. I'm interested in education. I think religion is not necessary for me. When I was young, I really read about Buddhist literature. Uh -huh. I read many books, not religion. That is my misunderstanding about religion. So you were pursuing knowledge of many different kinds, but not the spiritual kind of knowledge. Yes. Right. Only by my own experience about meditation, uh -huh. I became interested yeah. to ordain. I want to know, I want to taste, I want to taste the life of a monk. So, And how did that experience feel those five days? At that time, I have to read about the Vinaya. The monk's discipline. Yes. The 227 precepts of the monk. So you had to learn these during your five-day ordination. Yes. Uh, I. That was also a five-day meditation retreat. Mm -hmm. So I meditate, die after die, and also I learn about discipline of the monk. It made me interesting. How was this affecting your attitude towards your business at the time? After the temporary ordination, I started to meditate daily, one hour at house. In the beginning, it is difficult because noisy. Right. Uh, my apartment is near the bus station. Mm -hmm. So there are noise of the spare. Mm -hmm. They are shouting for the passenger. Uh, beside, the electricity is not stable, so there are generators right. when the electric is out. 
So it is noisy. Very noisy, yes. And yes. Burmese bus conductors are also known to be very noisy too. Yes. Yes, so that's so you had a lot of worldly distractions as you were trying to go inside. Yes, mm -hmm. but I have no choice. So I'm trying to overcome that difficulty and uh, I can meditate every morning. I also went to the meditation retreat often. Besides, I started I started a foundation, a small foundation, uh, by free dis by free distribution about the Ma books and the Ma CD, the Ma teaching. I went to the meditation center and then I bought books and teaching and then I rent for free in my shop. Right. So in a country like Myanmar, where there's an absence of libraries, it can sometimes be hard for people to have access to reading material. So uh, sometimes people such as yourself set up a local community library or personal library, in this case, a Dhamma library, where anyone was free to come and access those books. Yes. So, yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Um, one thing I'm curious about is if you can share a little about which meditation centers you were going to, which practices you were learning, and how the different practices were affecting you. After opening a small shot for the Ma books and teaching, mm -hmm. I was donated, donated as other the Ma books and teaching, especially Tengu method. Mm -hmm. Sonlon method and also Mahasi method. So it sounds like you practice a lot of uh, the different techniques you practice. You've already referenced Mogok, Goenka, Sunlun, Tengu, Mahasi. I learn. I learn Tengu method, Sonlon method, Mahasi method, but I don't practice. Mm -hmm. I practice Mogok method. I listen the teaching of Tengu Siado when I am not willing to meditate. Yes, because he had a very, his, his teaching was very severe and very, yes, yes. very intense. Yes. So when you had laziness, you yes, used yes. Thayangu to motivate you. Yes, yes. I use uh, to motivate myself right. in meditation. They it say, is really useful when I listen about his teaching. Right. They say at Thayangu Center, sometimes they would tie the legs of the meditators so that they physically would not be able to move for one, two, three, four hours. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's a very, very severe teaching. Yes. But for me, I, I love wisdom. I use to think a lot. Mm -hmm. For me, it is suitable with Mogul method. Teaching of Mogul Siara is about the truth of meditation. Right. He can explain a lot. There's a lot of theory in Mogok method more than the other methods. There's yes, yeah. a real focus on understanding things intellectually and theoretically with the understanding that a deeper intellectual knowledge will lead to a deeper meditative experience. Yes. Yeah. So, so I understand you liked Mogok for the intellectual explanations and you liked Tayangu for the... Um, seriousness and intensity of meditation. How about some of the others? Lady Medet Goenga and Siai Ubakin. Uh -huh. uh, it is also useful How so? to, to practice systematically. Hmm. So I went Dandy retreat in uh, Ubakin Center. IMC. And also, yes, mm -hmm. IMC. And also Dandy retreat in Goenga Center. Mm -hmm. in Myanmar. And did you practice Lady Sayada at a separate center or just through IMC and Goenka Center? No practice in Lady Center. Right. Just practice uh, only Ubakin and Goenka Center. Right. And what did you appreciate about that experience? They emphasize to be systematic. So it is suitable especially for the foreigners. Uh -huh. I have to learn from them, from their teaching and retreat. Mm -hmm. I have to learn a lot. That made me, after dandy retreat at Goenga Center, I can successfully make a decision to use my belongings and apartment and the cars 
one of the uh, at that time there's two car but I have to sell one of the car and then give back for the debt after that I decided no more business just continues to practice seriously and it was the Goenka course that yes confirmed that decision in you yes right yeah yeah so it sounds like each of these different teachings and wisdoms from the different centers all gave you different tools and strategies to work with they all had a different gift that they gave you yes yeah and that should be said this is one of the advantages and blessings of being in Myanmar is that you're able to learn these different interpretations and methods of the Buddha that people are teaching today. This is not something easily found in other countries. Yes, yes. Um, one question, did you, did you ever feel um, confused or uh, overwhelmed that you were practicing different kinds of techniques at the same time? Because there is an advice out there that one should stick with just one technique only and that practicing more than one technique at a time or regularly could lead to some kind of confusion uh, during the practice. So did, did um, and it sounds like you were having a full toolbox of a lot of different teachers and techniques. So did you find any sense of confusion in doing a lot of things at the same time? Or what, what, what do you think about that concern? No. For me, I emphasize on wisdom. Besides, because of running my own business for over 70, for over seven years continuously, mm -hmm. I have the ability to, to work seriously. Uh, because besides, within seven years of my own business experience, I have to make a lot of decision that make me that made me develop both in intellectual and physical activities. So when I started to learn about the teaching of Mogu Siara, I don't have much difficulty. I can understand a lot. But what I need is to practice seriously. That's why I have to listen to the teaching of Dengu Siara. Right. It made me encourage right. to practice uh, seriously, to meditate for long hours. Maybe I love, I love wisdom. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm intelligent enough to, to use each method in the right way. If I started, if I am not much intelligent, I may practice only one uh, tradition. Because I am intelligent enough, that's why I can clarify the weakness and good points of each method. So, although I meditate at Goenka Center, I was learned to practice only one method, but I practice both. More, more than both, it sounds like you practiced yes. several, many, a handful. Yes, yeah. yeah, yes. Right. Because at the retreat, I follow their guidance. Uh, right, at the retreat you go I to. I practice yeah. by myself also. Mm -hmm. So that is not usual for most of the meditator. But for me, I believe in my practice. So that is their suggestion to follow only one tradition will not be affected to me. Mm -hmm. Because I... I can understand more mm -hmm. because I emphasize wisdom mm -hmm. than system. For Goenka method, they emphasize to be systematic. Mm -hmm. uh, for Mahasi method, they emphasize uh, Buddhist literature. For Tsen Tengu method, they emphasize diligence, uh, varia, varia. They emphasize effort. Effort, yes, yes. Uh, but for me, I emphasize on wisdom. That's why I can understand many things compared with the other trees, other meditators. Mm -hmm. So no, no problem for me. So how did this all affect your business? What did you, you, you mentioned after a Goenka retreat, you had the strong volition to 
to sell one of your cars and apartments, I think you said. Um, what ended up happening with your business as you kept along developing deeper in Dhamma still as a layperson at that point? Before I meditate, I have problems uh, in my business. But after practicing meditation regularly, I came to understand that I can... If I continue doing like this, I can get much success in business because of the power of mindfulness and detachment. But at that time, I already experienced a lot about business. So to get success in business is not strange for me. Uh -huh. But I don't know what is the success of meditation. Right. So oh. if I emphasize to practice meditation seriously, what will happen? I'm not sure. Right. So that was the next mystery. That was yes. the next step. There will be many good things, but I cannot imagine. Right. That's why I decided to emphasize on meditation by my own experience. Right. So it sounds like during these years, you were still a lay person. You were still caught in a business life. You were practicing different Myanmar-based traditions of uh, meditation um, in the country, and you were having a daily meditation practice while still being somewhat involved in the business. So at some point, you obviously made the decision to seek a more permanent ordination and also a more absolute renunciation of that life. And when did that happen? After coming back from Goenga Center, I practiced seriously at my apartment at the district. But unfortunately, the weather is not good. It is summer, very hot. Very hot, yes. So it is difficult to get concentration because of the weather, the mind is not stable. Mm -hmm. That is not the right time to practice seriously. But I continue to eat less and less and to sleep less and less at my own apartment. The result is I, I lose my health. I, I cannot breathe for very well. I became very tired when I walk. Mm -hmm. So I have to go to the Dauda. And after medical checkup, I came to know that uh, I have been suffering TB, tuberculosis. Oh. Yes. That's very serious. Yes. Because of practicing seriously mm. with less food and mm. less rest, it made me uh, lose my help. It was too intense. Yes. But at that time, I don't want to stop my practice. So I decided to continue the practice even if I die. Uh, that is also make me endure to lose my life for meditation. What happened when you received the TB diagnosis? At that time, uh, my father was staying only in Myanmar. Uh -huh. My mother and brothers already uh, went abroad. Uh -huh. So when he heard about my disease, he went me to take treatment. But in the beginning, I don't obey him. But he became very angry. Uh -huh. Because of her anger, I decided to take treatment for six months. Before I meditate, I don't I cannot emphasize on the mind. When I meditate, I came to understand that the mind is the most important. Mm. That's why I emphasize to fulfill the need of the mind. That's why I don't want my father to be angry all the time because of 
not the game medicine. So I decided to take treatment and I after treatment I have to stop my practice because of mm. the side effect is strong. I cannot meditate. I have to eat a lot and sleep a lot mm-hmm. to get more weight, to be healthy, to endure the side effect of the medicine also. Right. Very serious medicine. Yes. And then after you recovered, what decision did you make next? After six months of taking medicine, the doctor decided to continue three months more. But I was not patient enough. That's why I take medicine and go to the meditation center, mm. Mogo center. Okay. I practice by taking medicine at the Dandy retreat of Mogo Center. Mm. After that, uh, I'm I'm satisfied with my practice and I decided to be a monk after 10 months later. What year was this that you did full ordination? It was in 2002. I decided in February, uh, I decided in the beginning of 2002 and then at September 2002, Mm -hmm. I became a monk. Mm -hmm. And you've been in robes since that time? Yes. Were you, um, had you been married or had you been in a relationship? No. No. Because I was interested in education. Mm -hmm. After that, I was interested in business. So I'm I'm not much free. To think of marriage, marriage. So that wasn't something you had to give up for ordination? Yes. Then in 2004, you became a uh, a bhikkhu, you became a full monk. And take us from that time that you were a full monk into um, your arrival in Danlian when what is now the Bawa, as I'm told, was very rural, swampy, wild land. Um, how did you get from 2004 ordination to... 2002. Two, so, excuse me, 2002 ordination to uh, eventually ending up in um, Denlian? As soon as I became a monk, I got an idea to teach, to to my devotees who come for ordination ceremony. So I teach, after ordination ceremony, I teach them guided meditation about half an hour. My preceptor monk monk experienced my teaching and he suggested me, if you are able to teach, you can teach at his monastery. That's why I started teaching a few days after my ordination ceremony up there now. Right. And where were you living in, in 2002 when you ordained? Where was your monastery at that time? The monastery was in Thainfu Street. Thainfu Street. I, I did stay for 10 months continuously. After that, uh, I have to move to one of the, the Maho which is belong to the township, Mingla Downyon, which is belong to one of the, a group of lay people. In Myanmar, uh, there is the Maho nearly in every street or right. every township. Mm-hmm. So I was invited to teach there. So I continued teaching at that place nearly f- four years continuously. Mm-hmm. After that, I can successfully establish food fishery center. Right. I teach most of, most of the time at the food fishery center. Forty fifth Street Center was a dhamma hall or a monastery or apartment. What what was it? Meditation center. It was a meditation center. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it has eight apartments, so it is big enough to to open a center. One apartment is about twenty five by 60 feet mm-hmm. and can buy two together. So it is 50 by 60 feet, the Maho. And this is 
Thaimpu Street. So this is basically downtown Yangon. Yes, near Sule Pagoda. Near Sule Pagoda. So this is kind of, for people who have never been here, this is kind of the heart of central Yangon. So you're in the West, often they establish these meditation centers in rural areas of nature and quiet. And your meditation center was an apartment complex in the center of very busy Yangon. So this was somewhat unusual. Yes, yeah. Yeah. That place is not much crowded at that time because uh, it was a short street, not too long. Mm -hmm. uh, Besides, there's also uh, government, government belongings. So not high-rise building. There's a school, government school and police office like that. Right. So the, the street is not, not much crowded. Mm. That's why I choose that place to establish meditation center. But now it became crowded. Right. How many people ended up coming there? At the first meditation center, uh, there are nearly 200 people can stay there. Mm -hmm. It was one apartment complex, is that right? It was a story building, a story building with 16 apartments at the building. And so you... I bought eight apartments, half of the building. So half was residential apartments with families yes. still living there and half yes. was a meditation center. Yes, yes. Yes, right. So your meditation center was happening as daily life around was taking place. Yes. Yeah, right. It is really successful because... People have no idea to open a meditation center like this. Right. <laughs> yeah. But it is very easy hmm. to, to go there. Hmm. So many people can meditate uh, at, the, at the meditation center. Right. So this was 2002 until? 2007. 2007. So 2002 you were ordained. Yes. And... After five years teaching by myself, not uh, not my own meditation center. I was, I have been teaching at the house and hospital where I was invited. Only after five years continuous teaching, I can successfully establish uh, my own meditation center in downtown of Yango. So from 2007, you started your your downtown meditation center in uh, half of an apartment complex. Yes. Right. Yeah. From 2007, how many years did that progress where you continued? And was it uh, Tempu Street where you were? Okay. 45th Street. 45th Street. So 40. it was a 45th Street meditation center in 2007. Yes. Right. This center was crowded within a few months. How many people? Nearly 200 people. 200 people. Yes. Can stay there. For long time. Wow. That's why we have to think of another place. So they're sleeping, they're bathing, they're eating, they're yes. meditating, they're getting Dhamma instruction. Yes. Yeah. But the price uh, at downtown is expensive. Very. That's why yes. we cannot buy many apartments. Mm -hmm. So I have to think of uh, another center in another location. Uh, that was Tanlin Senda. Yes. So it started in 2008 uh, because of the need of the monk. At the time, uh, there is point cost to the government by the monks also. Right. Because of uh, involving in politics, mm -hmm. the monks get into trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, the monastery are not allowed the monks to stay, uh, monetary are not allowed. The monks, op the monks have difficulty to stay at the monastery, because if the monastery accept the monks who are doing politics, uh, they will get into trouble. That's why uh, many monks come to our center at Delhi. They also come to Forty First. Right. For the first week center. Right. If we could back up just a moment, because I'm not clear on how you actually got to Thanlian. So 2007 was when you started the 45th Street Center. Yes. The end of 2007, I think it was maybe September, October, that 
2007 when the Saffron July. Revolution. Sorry. Food Fishery Center was established in July 2000. Uh, 2007. Right. And I think it was, was it October 2007 when the Saffron Revolution started? Maybe. September, October. So yeah. the Sa- the Saffron Revolution, we can look that up later. The Saffron Revolution, in any case, started only several months after you began your, um, your 45th Street Center. Yes. And then a half a year later, there was Cyclone Nargis, which was another cataclysmic event uh, that yes. happened to Yangon. So how did how did these events affect your teaching in your downtown meditation center? Because of the political crisis, uh, we have to close 45th Street Center oh. about 18 months. So, so soon after starting your own meditation center, just a few months later, you have to close it for a year and a half. After one year uh, later, hmm. The government forced to close the center mm-hmm. because there are many people in the center and it is really dangerous right. for the government. It wasn't meeting health codes. <laughs> so, yes, yes. Yeah, so the, the safety of the people was uh, could not be guaranteed. So, yeah, yeah. Right, right. So what did you do then? I have to, I have to move to Tanlian. Mm-hmm. All the people, the old and some of the sick people have to move to Tanya. Tanya Center was established in August August of 2008. Maybe two years later, not one year. After, after two years later, uh, we have to close for the district center and then uh, everyone in the center move to Tanya Center. Right, so you're you're in 45th Street, which is downtown, but it's also uh, overcrowded. It's a health risk. It might be convenient, but it's overcrowded with people. And then you go to Tan Lien. And for people who've never been to Myanmar, can you describe where Tan Lien is located in relation to Yangon downtown, which is where you were before? Tan Lien is different from Yangon because uh, it is there's a river uh, between Tanlin and Yangon. Yeah, Yangon River. Yes. Yeah. So the weather is different, uh, not much developed at that time at Tanlin. There's a famous pagoda, Jaikop, uh, Jaikop pagoda at Tanlin. So I was donated about three acres of land mm-hmm. at Tanlin. Mm-hmm. Maybe in 2006, mm-hmm. 2006, uh, but I, I used that place only in 2008 because of the problems in 45th Street. Right, right. So you had been given this land before, but only now did you have a use for it. Yes. And so to reach Stanley Inn from downtown, you have to go across a bridge, across yeah. Yangon River, across some some of the Yangon canals. And then after crossing the bridge, you have to drive 30, 45 minutes about. Yes, yes. Yep. So, so after crossing the bridge and leaving Yangon, you have to go another 30, 45 minutes to reach this land which you were donated. Yes. So it was really outside of city limits. Yes. In the last 10 years, the state of Yangon and the areas outside of Yangon have really changed dramatically. Can you describe what situation you found in 2009 when you moved to your new environment? In Yango? No, in Tanlian. Oh, Tanlian. Yeah, what was it like then? It must have been very wild and rural and lack of facilities, I imagine. There are many meditation centers in Tanlian. That's why there's not much big land uh, in downtown of Tanlian. Mm-hmm. So... Only near the Jacob Goda, right. there are uh, big land. The price are also cheaper inside. Right. Uh, on the main road, it is expensive, but inside, it is cheap. So I have to choose that place because that area is not, not developed. So what was it like moving 
yourself and all these people and living on undeveloped land? Were you living in buildings? Were you living in nature? Were you living in bamboo huts? What? How were you living at those times? Uh, only bamboo huts. Mm -hmm. Because we are urgent, we don't have much, much time. So we need to make bamboo hut urgently mm -hmm. and uh, we have to move the Biba from 45th Street to Dania. How many people were you moving? 150. 150 Biba. Mm. And these were all meditators? Uh, at the time, most of the people are not much interested in meditation mm. because the country is not stable, mm -hmm. so they, it is difficult to meditate, mm -hmm. but they have problems to stay in the society. That's why most of the people at that time are people in need of help for shelter, food, medicine, not much meditator. I see. So these were the people that were living in the 45th Street Meditation Center and that moved to the new compound in Denlian. Most of the people at this point were not meditators, but people that didn't have anywhere else to turn. It is really dangerous in the society at that time. It is better to stay in the meditation center, even if they are not meditating. So they were staying for safety? Yes. Right. Right. So you moved with these 150 people to a very rural and undeveloped land urgently where there weren't even any buildings, no yes. facilities. Yes. Probably no electricity? No electricity, but fortunately we get electric from the army beside. Mm -hmm. And running water? Did you have water at the time? Not very good at that time. Mm. Later, after a few years, we get, we can, uh, we get good water results from underground. Most of the water well are not, not, not much good. Mm. Right, so it was not easy living conditions at the time. Yes, yes. Right. No trees. Mm. So it is difficult. No big tree and no good roads. Most of the house are just small hugs. They are not educated. They don't have regular job. So they are they die often both young and old. They are fighting most of the time. It sounds between, like very difficult conditions. Other. Yes, sure. Your followers are fighting with each other. Uh, because we are teaching here, but uh, the villagers are, are shouting each other or fighting each other uh, at their hut. Right. So we, it is common. They cannot control by themselves, although they are staying near the monks and nuns and meditators. That's why it is really difficult to survive in Tanlin mm -hmm. Center mm -hmm. in the beginning of the center. But we, we have no choice because there are many problems in most of the place of the countries. Right. So we try to survive by ourselves, uh -huh. by doing good deeds together. We have to support to the villagers also by going Armstrong and by accepting in the center if they are sick, they cannot cure by themselves. So we have to help them for what they need. That's why we can do many great things at Tanli. Mm -hmm. Not 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 like that at 45th Street, mm -hmm. 45th Street right. Center. Yes. Downtown area has limit. Yes. Not everyone can stay there, mm -hmm. uh, go there. Uh, Tanlin Tanlin Center is uh, not in downtown of Tanlin, at the outskirts of Tanlin. So most of the families there are homeless, uh, in travel with job and help. So you had space and room to expand there. Yes. 
So who, so you, you come there with 150 people that are in many of whom are in difficult situation, come to a place that's wild and lacking facilities, lacking building and live next to villagers that themselves are having problems and uh, arguments and fighting. And what happens next? After one and a half years later, we we reopened the 45th Street Center again. We can meet with a donor at 45th Street. In the beginning of Tanlin Center, uh, most of the people don't want to visit to the center. The people from the 45th Center, 45th Street Meditation Center, don't want to visit Tanlin, you mean? Uh, the donor also. Mm-hmm. But no choice, that's why. They have to mm-hmm. move for the first street. Right. But for the donors at downtown, mm-hmm. they they don't want to come to Danling. Mm-hmm. It is far away, so uh, I have to receive their donation at for the first street mm-hmm. center. Right. So you had to travel back. It is forward. also it is good to have for the first street center before Danling center develop. Mm-hmm. We have no choice, no other choice. That's why we emphasize to do good deeds more and more at Daniel Center. Although there are many difficulties, we continue doing good deeds and it develops slow and steadily. Only after six years later, 2014, Daniel Center became stable because of the media. In 2012, uh, the, the media can write freely. It the country the, opened up at that time. Yes. So the, the, there was a state censor that resigned the position and, and free press was allowed yes, yeah. more than it had been previous to 2012. Yes. So that opening of the country affected your center? Sure. Hmm. And when you say that your sta- your center was not stable, in what ways was life unstable in Tenlian before 2012? 2014. 2014. In, in what ways, when you say that there was instability, how did that instability manifest? There are many problems between each other. Many complaints to the governments also. The government complained about uh, your center. Some of the people may report to the government. We are opening the center illegally. Mm-hmm. We are making building without permission. Uh, we there. We are fighting each other in the center. Uh, that kind of a message sent to the government. Mm-hmm. That's why we are we are unstable. People in the center have to worry what will happen tomorrow. Nothing is sure. When you moved in 2009, you mentioned there was a population of 150. Um, How did the population increase or be affected as time went on? Did more people come? Yes, people are coming continuously, but not, not to support us, but to... Refuge in the center. To do what? To refuge. refuge. Oh, to take refuge. To take refuge. People were coming to take center. refuge. What kinds of people were taking refuge? Especially the monks and the old, the sick, they cannot survive by themselves in the society. So they heard about the center and they are coming all the time. We have to accept it. Although we don't have enough shelter, we have to make temporary building all the time. How, how, what kind of numbers are we talking about? How many people were coming at this time? We're talking dozens or hundreds or what exactly? The number of the population at Daniel Center is developing all the time. Mm. Within a few years, the to the population arrived about nearly two thousand. Mm-hmm. 
So you went from 150 people yes. to 2,000 people in just a few years? Yes. Right. And these were people that were not coming so much to support your mission, but yes. people who needed to be taken care of yes. for because of disease, because of old age, because of some other problem, because some people were actually in the state of dying. It became something of a hospice center as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. And also, as I've heard, many people with mental illness. Yes. Which is, and can you say something about how is mental illness regarded in Myanmar society? Most of the mental patients are sent to mental hospital. At the hospital, they have to take drugs. They have to stay there for a few days. Only after they begin stable, they can come back to the house, to, to the home, to their family. That is not, there's no choice, no other choice. Whether they want to stay or not, they have to stay at the mental hospital. Whether they want to take medicine or not, they have to take medicine. And that is not really work. Uh -huh. So in our center, we accept all kinds of people, including mental patients, to let their mind to be stable and pure. They are free at our center to do what they want. They are not free in the society. And so as you're welcoming all these hundreds and even thousands of people, what was the reaction at the time? What was the reaction of the villagers, of the government? Um, what, what was the, the general reaction uh, for all these new people now coming in? The first reaction was concerned with the people in the center. They don't want to welcome the sick people and the mental patient. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. Yes. But I have to explain them. It is necessary to do. They are in great need of help. So if we take care of them, we can get graded merits and we can get success. We can get success in our job. Right. And can you say, is this normal or unusual in a Myanmar monastery to welcome these kinds of people? In most of the well-known meditation center, there are many rules and regulations. So, oh, and sick people and mental patients are not allowed right. to practice at the center. Right. Because of my own experience mm -hmm. about meditation, mm -hmm. I came to understand that meditation is for all especially for the own sick people. Mm -hmm. So I want to correct that mistake. Mm -hmm. That's why I emphasize to open a meditation center, especially for the own sick people. Right. That is essential. That is really great things to do. Mm and got many benefits because of doing like this. Mm. And did the was the government in support of these people that were now coming in that you were providing refuge for? The former government was not much interested uh, to help the people in need, but the new government is working uh, for the people. Mm -hmm. I mean, initially, when all these people were coming to your center, this was something very unusual for monasteries and meditation centers at the time. So I'm curious about how the local officials and the government responded to so many people in need taking refuge in a meditation center. What was the, the reaction uh, as this was growing from 150 to 2,000 and more people? At that time... 
Many people in the society think the power center tunneling is not a good place mm. because not much metadata, just old and sick people and mental patients. Some are alcoholics and drug addicts. There are many bad views about the center in the society and mm. we are difficult to survive if they heard about the power center they think really bad place we cannot solve the the problems oh we have to do goodies by ourselves right so you don't really have a lot of support or outside understanding to the mission that you're trying to achieve yes Mm. I think one story that I heard at the time was that there was a repeated attempt by the authorities to have the people that were taking refuge there uh, taken out. And, but the problem was there was nowhere else for them to go. So yeah. there was a desire for them to not be allowed to go there, but they had no solution where else they could go, so there was nothing that could ever happen. Maybe there are many problems concerned with the government. I myself also, I have to accuse many things. My teaching is wrong. My teaching is not Tiawara, and I was not obeying the senior monks. Who accused you of this? Some of the lay people, they learned from me in the beginning, but when their children came to meditate with me, the children are um, more intelligent, so they practice seriously. Mm -hmm. So they became nuns and full-time meditators. They cannot endure. They cannot lose their children. That's why they, they make problems to me, to the center. In my side, I'm helping the people uh, who meditate, not to go in the wrong way, to get success in meditation. But people are thinking highly of themselves, so they are grasping what they understand. So they, don't, they cannot accept the power center because of welcoming everyone to stay in the center. Mm -hmm. For the old and sick people, not much problem. But for the young people, there's problem for their parents. Right. So you had difficulty with the villagers that live next to you. You had difficulty with the authorities that didn't want to give you permission for, for what you were doing. And it sounds like you also had difficulties with other Buddhists or monks who didn't accept uh, that even what you were teaching was authentic. So it sounds like you, you really had difficulties and challenges coming from every single area from which it could come. Yes. How did you persevere? How did you manage? I cannot stop the sender. I cannot stop teaching because Many people are relying on the center and on my teaching. Because of my teachings, they can endure, they can survive. Because of great benefit, I continue teaching and opening the center. Because of not stopping my job, there are more complaints to the government. What did people complain about? In, 2000, in 2012, one of the government officers report to, the, to their senior. The power center is opening illegally and making construction without permit. It is really dangerous. Many people are staying at the center also. That's why it is really dangerous mm -hmm. for the politics. Uh, because of that robots, uh, the 
government decide to close the center. So mm. they, they came to the center. Uh, many officers from different environments, the police or the authorized person in township, and also the authorized monks, they meet together at the center. They are trying to close the center, but the monks cannot accept that idea because they know many people in the center have no place to go. So if they close the center and drive them away, they are sure to die right. in the street. I see. So if, if it happened like this, the monks has responsibility by killing the people. Mm -hmm. So that is really big, uh, because we need. It sounds like a very dramatic scene. You had police and government officials from all different departments. You have senior monks and member of the Sangha, and they're all coming together in mass on one day to close the center down and kick everyone out. Yes. Is that what happened? Yes. But they didn't. Yes. So how, how did that get avoided? The government officer suggested us to report to the government. People are leaving the center. So only uh, 1,000 people may still remain like that. About 100 people leave the center this week and next week. Uh, right. About another 100 people leave. They, they guide us mm -hmm. to report to mm -hmm. the government like this. In right. this way, they can also report to the government they are in operation to close the center. Right. And is that what happened? Yes. That, that's what happened? No, no. Oh. <laughs> just, just robot, no. Ah, so just... <laughs> no action. No, right. No action. Just people what? Here in this country, mm. it is like that. They just wanted to see the paperwork. Yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> they, they are not much taking care of the real condition. And then the problem went away? Yes. Oh, right. <laughs> because I take care of the old and sick people. Mm -hmm. That's why old and sick people... Uh, take care of me. This, I'm, I protect them. That's why they protect me mm -hmm. and the power center. Mm -hmm. This is cause and effect. Mm -hmm. If I'm not protecting O and C people, there will be no the power center, for sure. Mm -hmm. So it is uh, doing good. This is really essential, really powerful. Mm -hmm. And you would mention that something very interesting that. When the company, when the country started to open up, 2012, 2014, the availability of freedoms in the press helped your center to survive. So, can you say more about that? How did the free press help you? Before the free press, there's no news about the power center. Uh huh. Although there is the power center. In Tani, the local authorities cannot report to the government because if they report, we we cannot survive. But they understand me. They know what we are doing. There is really good for the people in need. That's why they cannot allow us legally. But they don't. They cannot reject. <laughs> right. That's why yeah. they they allow us to do by ourselves. So somehow you're able to yeah. keep surviving. But yes. um, I'm also curious, how did the free press help you? You you mentioned that when the country started to open up and newspapers had more control over what they wrote, that was a major transformation in your center's activity. I, I think you said 2012 was when they started to open up and 2014 was when you felt, um, I don't remember the words you used, some kind of safe, safety or stability, I think you said. I think you said before 2014, you had constant instability. And after 2014, because of the free press, you started to enjoy greater stability. So I'm wondering what connection that has. 
when there is writing about the Bhava Sandha, in the beginning of the writings about the Bhava Sandha in journal or newspaper, the message is wrong because we answer the actual condition. But people in the society, even the journalists, they have no idea about this kind of meditation center. That's why, although we answer the truth, they cannot understand very well and their writing is like the other meditation center. Mm-hmm. Because they used to know about the meditation center like that. That's mm. why when they write about the Bhava Center, they write the same as traditional meditation center. Right. But time after time, uh, more and more journalists come to the center and they came to know more and more about the Bhava Center and they can write effectively more and more. In 2014, one of the famous channel write about the power center, but he's writing on behalf of the people who are staying in the center. Mm-hmm. He is not writing as a reporter. Mm-hmm. He is writing as a the people who refuse, who take refuse in the center. Mm-hmm. So it really effective and people who read about that message. So there is one specific article yes, that yes. really that, broke through. That made the people to, to help the ONC people in the center. Right. So that so this one article was the breakthrough that you were looking for. Yes. Right. Many people know about the center because uh, know about the center, uh, especially for the ONC people. There are many quantity and they are in need of help. That's why besides there because of that article, uh, some other channel and T V station mm-hmm. they take news from the center. So it sparked so it an continues yeah. mm-hmm. uh, one after another right. and more and more people are coming to the center to support as much as they can. Right, right. And do you think this kind of article could have been written before 2012 or not possible? In Before 2012? Mm. Could an article like this appear or would it not be possible to write an article like that before? Yeah, yeah. In former years, uh, the government were not allow the people, were not allow the writers to write about the travel of the people in mm. the country. Right, yeah. So... Because of the free press, people have chance to know the truth about the country and people. Right. So as the country opens up, and most people know that it opened up very recently, we know about the effects that's had on business and imports and technology and education and some of these other things. But this is very interesting because you're saying that the, con- the effect that the country opening up had on the monastery was also very profound and that your monastery was actually doing this before the country opened up, but yes. no one knew about it yes. and support was very difficult and you were in a very stressful situation of not knowing if you could last another day. But yes. once that opening happened, it allowed actual factual reporting of what was happening and once people started to learn about it and know about it they also wanted to support it and that the society becoming freer was of great help for you in the survival and stability of the monastery right very interesting for us 12 years of 12 year experience of the power center is a very short time mm. because many interesting things are happening all the times and we we don't know how fast the time is running we are very busy but we are satisfied yes
I hope you enjoyed the interview with the Bawa Sayeda as much as I did. There's a lot in that discussion to unpack. And for those less familiar with Vipassana meditation or Burmese Buddhism, monasticism, overall Burmese history, and the current state of Myanmar today, some parts of the talk might be worth reflecting on a bit more. For that reason, I'm going to connect with my good Dhamma friend, Zach Hessler, and share some thoughts about the discussion you just heard. Zach has quite a bit of experience in the Golden Land, from intensive meditation retreats and pilgrimages, to work assignments, and for three years as a forest monk. So he has quite a bit of background to draw upon in catching the deeper themes involved in the talk and bringing them in for consideration. We hope that this reflection will provide listeners a broader context in which to place the content that you've just heard. Zach is currently living in rural Thailand, and we'll just give a quick Skype call now to check in with him. Hey, Zach, are you there? Yeah, how are you doing, Joe? Yeah, I'm doing well. How's, uh, how's life treating you there in Thailand? Yeah, well, you know, I've been uh, recovering from illness since uh, New Year's, but I'm coming around. Uh, weather's pretty good. A uh, bit of smoke in the air, but uh, at least it makes for uh, colorful sunsets. <laughs> yeah, right. It does that. Yeah. So you ready to talk a little bit about the, um, this uh, interview with the Baba Sayeda? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, cool. So what were your initial impressions hearing it? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's such uh, the whole the Bawa experience is such a phenomenon even now, right? And then, and then to go back to to listen to Sayad, I'll tell the the story of it is was really a, I mean, <laughs> it was such a phenomenon well before it got to. I mean, it's already gotten somewhere by now, uh, and to know that what it gone through just to get to this point is an incredible story. Yeah, yeah, right. I I thought so too. And, you know, I, um, one of the things that really struck me when I was, uh, when I was listening to it was, you know, for one thing, this is a really interesting origin story, both of um, the Bawa Sayeda as a person, as well as the monastery itself and the whole mission. But um, for listeners that are hearing this, that don't really know where it ended up, it's um it's kind of a whole other level because uh this isn't just the story of some burmese monk that made some kind of burmese meditation center this is actually a real outlier of a kind of individual and organization doing something very very different in burmese buddhism and meditation today and so hearing the stages that that the sayada went through and that the the mission and the organization went through and how tenuous it was is all the more remarkable when you find out where it ended up, which is something that a lot of listeners might not really know from just hearing how calmly and casually he's describing the process. And so I think to really gain some kind of appreciation for the, con- for the context of, of what it is they're doing, I think um, you know, it's important to give listeners just some idea of, of how different and how unique uh, this monastery and Sayada are in Burmese Buddhism today. And, uh, and to do that, you know, we've both spent time, well, we both spent a lot of time in, in Burmese Buddhist monasteries, and we both also spent time at Tabawa. And to just share some personal experience, so, you know, the first time I went to Tabawa, um, for several times, I had just a mix of emotions I didn't really know where to put. You know, I felt um, appreciative and grateful and amazed and also confused and even a little disgusted at, at the, um, the, the level of activity and chaos and, at times that was going on around. Um, I felt conflicted. Um, I, uh, at, at times I, I wondered, I had a mix of, of appreciation and amazement and awe at what they were doing while also wondering if there was a little bit of naivete and if it was too ambitious. And I think it's also worth describing the experience of a friend of ours who, who, who's been to Myanmar several times and been to India as well as a longtime meditator. Um, but on his first visit to the monastery, he was only there, you know, hour, hour and a half. And he said he felt such an intense reaction to the, the, the activity and the dirt and the chaos and everything else 
that he felt he he just had to get out of there. This is and this is not a person who you know hasn't traveled to these kind of places before, but you know <laughs> ended up saying he felt a little bit bad about himself that you know his self esteem that he saw you know how many people were living here and working here and engaged in some way and just ninety minutes was almost hard for him to be able to manage um, before leaving. So it's you know it really is an an intense place and knowing that intensity and how unique it is changes the way you look at the story of how he told. And I'm also wondering about, you know, your own experience and, uh, and reaction being there. Yeah, I, I didn't have quite that reaction, but kind of back to the, the flood of different feelings you were talking about just before our friend's story. The interesting, I, I think, thing about that, I had a lot of those things too, the confusion, the all kinds of things. The thing is like, the other features, like none of those could land and form a solid opinion. I, I couldn't, there's, there's so much uncertainty around what was coming through my mind, whether it was praise or criticism or confusion or whatever. It was, it's, it's new in a way. So you're, I'm confronted with this. Like, I don't know, I don't have categories for these things. So I saw all the stuff bubbling up like that from all these different angles. But it, I think the unsettling part is it takes, and I don't know if it still has yet. Have I mm. landed on an overall opinion I mean, the general mm. opinion I have is it's a good thing, but that's not a settled mm. case in any kind of concrete way. It's just a feeling that like, hey, this is much more good than problematic. Um, and I don't think there's anything bad about it in in a really kind of clear way. So, yeah, that phenomenon, I think that's that's not the specific impression, I had, but that's the overall kind of feeling impression I had about about going there. And I still have, actually, to some degree. Yeah, and there's people that will be there for you know eight nine months that I've met, and will write about it after after an extended time, and even after that period, I've heard people say, you know, I've spent all this time there, and I still don't really know how to describe it. So, you know, and I think that that's such a contrast to just how calm and cool and collected the Sayada was in describing where he came from that, you know, pe people who haven't actually been there and are able to contrast it with the way monasteries and meditation centers usually are would would miss that part of it without us underlying it here. And, you know, if you look at the typical Burmese Buddhist monastery, you they, they do come in different shapes and forms, nothing as 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 unique and different of, of what this is. But, you know, there's places that are more geared towards study. They're almost like high schools or universities and you know teaching novices or nuns. Um, there's places that are primarily based around meditation. There's places that have social missions that are really helping the community. And, you know, there's some that are like retirement homes that are just kind of like you know, monks hanging out um, and, and not doing much. And there's places that are remote where people live in some kind of seclusion. So there's there's these different kinds of functions, but there is a shared commonality of, um, you know, of something about the Burmese Buddhist religious experience. And uh, and what's interesting about the Bawa is that it, it kind of comes from a, um, a place of this. I mean, there are features there and there are ways, there are many ways that, that the monastery behaves that you know it's, it's coming from a Burmese, a very typical Burmese Buddhist monastic setting. And yet it departs from there in pretty extreme and extraordinary ways. Right. Well, it's it's interesting. Yeah, so the whole approach is different, but so is just the looks of the place, right? So it, that's a nice way you you framed it all. Uh, it's like taking all of that and doing it all and doing it all on steroids, and then and then trying to cram all that into uh, about a quarter of the space they would need to do it comfortably. <laughs> so, so what stands out to me physically about the differences, for example, is the for example, like you go to a normal monastery and there's, it's just well-defined physically. There's, there's often a gate you go through, there's uh, compound walls that, that clearly delineate the space of the monastery. When I first mm -hmm. showed up at the Bawa, it's like, well, where is the actual monastery? And they're like, you're already in it. And there was no clearly defined point that I recognized that, that I was in it, right? There were some monastic looking buildings, you know, and so that's another feature uh, most monasteries that predominantly are have mostly monastic looking buildings, these Burmese style, clearly Buddhist buildings. Uh, and because of uh, what's going on at the Bawa Center, you know, you got two hospitals, you've got tuberculosis center, you've got a place that sells 
art or craft or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. You, you know, so there's so much going on there. It's just jam packed with, with different projects of all of everything you've mentioned and more, right? Uh, retirement center, meditation center, uh, study, maybe not as much, or I don't, I'm not sure about that, but it's like trying to cram all that in one small place with 3000 people or however many people there and in, in, in a space. So that the population density, that's the other thing. Like, you know, you go to most monasteries and it's, other than uh, perhaps like uh, the water festival times on a normal time, you know, the population density of a normal monastery is, isn't so dense, you know, but here, you know, it's just 24 seven. It's just the people live there. They're not visitors. They live there and there's visitors on top of that. And it's just, it's just a, a very highly densely populated place. So uh, these are unique features just physically. And then, of course, as we'll talk about the the other uh, aspects of, of it. Yeah, and then you have the people. I mean, you described some of the, the buildings, but, you know, you have, say, it had described in this talk, you have... You know, people really on, on the in the margins of society, people that are that are the unseen and um, you know the invisible, and and that are are just kind of pushed away from from um, from from just normal acceptance. You know, mentally ill and prostitutes and the dying and the diseased and. And then there's the foreigners that are also at the monastery, which are very different than the foreigners you would find at other monasteries. You know, you and I have been to many Burmese Buddhist monasteries and meditation centers, and we know, you know, um, uh, very well how the, kind of the vibe of the, the typical kind of uh, Dhamma crowd. Um, because they really attract a backpacker element at times, you know, it feels like it's a, uh, like they had just magically transported some building of Kosan Road into the middle of this Burmese Buddhist monastery. And you see these worlds coming together in such a way that I have never seen in any monastery before. So you have all these activities and people and functions and um, other things that are all taking place in a very concentrated area that usually are not superimposed and happening simultaneously. And they are here. So so it's really a very different different experience. Yeah, exactly. And and like we said, even so today it, it already seems like what is all this and and the story of it, like how it became this. Like so what's missing from that? It's so kind of what's the word? Shocking's not quite right, but something like that. It's so there's so much going on in the mind when you encounter it now that you know I'd never after listening to Sadhus talk, I never, I mean, I didn't really realize like how even where it might have come from just to get to this point. And, and mm. I, I find that story remarkable because, you know, Sadhus talking about how difficult it was in the beginning, like how uncomfortable it was, how the people, they had all these people together that he was taking care of and they were fighting with each other and all this other stuff. And there's all these problems and there's supposed to be like too many people for the space that they had. And, and, you know, all the normal conflicts that might come from that, uh, getting, having so many people together in one place at one time. And yet he made clear that, and I think this is phenomenal, this, this mm. belief he had, this faith right. of if we just work together to serve others you know, these two things that we serve others and we do this together. So, of course, when they're quarreling, it's not happening 100% of the time. But this is the the, the foundation of the whole thing, uh, mm -hmm. that, that the thread that runs through it all, that 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 keeps it together. And it, it was very unclear that that would actually manifest and work out. And so this phenomenal story starts with, uh, well... It starts with earlier than this, even in, in his life, mm -hmm. as we'll see. But, but uh, the actual mission of the Thabawa thing itself—it's not it, the way he managed it. Wasn't this kind of westernized, you know, entrepreneurial or goal-oriented, like CEO type? You know, that had clear goals, clear vision, and he kind of executes in a very, you know, to-do list kind of way. He just he lets everything manifest. I mean, within the boundaries of, of, you know, some common sense, right? Having, they right. do follow really basic guidelines there that everyone needs to follow as mm -hmm. far as you know, your behavior. But other than that, he, le he just lets nature flow. Mm. Well, that's the name of the, that's what the monastery means is nature, right? 
Absolutely. It's a bawa, nature, right? So it really does manifest, but it takes an incredible amount of faith not to want to step in and, and rescue in a very kind of administerial way any of the issues that arise. And not that that can't happen to some degree, but but the the, the heart of it is this faith in in serving others together. And and uh, yeah, that just that just blows me away. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that that really amazed me during the talk was just how much the the political events taking place in Myanmar were actually affecting this monastery. You know, you think about this expression, let let unto Caesar what a Caesar kind of the the. The, the separation of church and state that, you know, that you have a, a kind of religious or spiritual function that happens on one side and you have, a, you know, the worldly legislative affairs that happen on the other. And certainly there's some relationship between those. But I have to say, and my my time at Burmese Buddhist monasteries over the and, and, and uh, meditation centers over the last 10 plus years, uh, I was struck by the fact that, wow, it it doesn't seem to matter that much in, in cases who's in charge. And I, I don't mean to um, to minimize, you know, the importance of having, um, you know, good leadership and, and the society you live in. But what I mean is that, like, the monks wake up at the same time, they have to eat by a certain time, they have the vinya that, you know, they've been following for, you know, however many centuries of 227 rules of, of monastic discipline. Um, they, they study, they learn, they pass on the teachings. And these are things that just seem to happen under whatever the society is, whatever, whatever the political system and the leadership is. And I'm, I'm sure there's, there's, there's some level of, of, um, causality in that, but, um, but there's also a certain kind of, um, of, of consistency that, that I'd come to kind of, uh, have in my mind when looking at, at, at these monasteries and meditation centers. And so, you know, I think the surprise is evident in my voice when he dis in, he describes these exist these series of existential threats and crises that that they're facing. And when I asked him what brought about the stability, his answer really amazed me. And that was that you know the the country opening up and the fact that um, that they were that with these new freedoms that they were the people were able to properly learn about through a free press. Uh, you know, because the the state censor uh, of Myanmar resigned, um, so the press had more freedom to be able to explore stories of their interest. And I think it's really interesting to see that as Myanmar develops and innovates, how this is an example of a monastery that is trying to reach back to a, a twenty five year twenty five hundred year tradition and find these new and totally unconventional ways to be modern and relevant in a changing society, and that. And it also made me just really excited to be able to have this story as one of the first ones in our podcast series, because one of the things we wanted to talk about was uh, was these other stories of Myanmar that you don't hear as reported as much. And, you know, here's an example of a Burmese Buddhist monastery that is doing something in a very new and innovative way and um, and is serving society and is taking care of people in need and is bringing Dhamma in very new and unusual ways breaking with the past. And I think this is just such a great for people who really care about what's going on in Myanmar right now and how it's changing, um, as well as people interested in Dhamma and meditation. I think that this is such an important story to learn and understand and that's affecting so many people in a, a way that, that, that has really basically never happened before here. Right. Uh, he was just basically holding it all together, uh, not knowing uh, it took a lot of courage. He's holding all together with what I talked about just before, this faith in serving others as a community with all the issues that were arising. And you're right, it was in a, it was in a, it was within a greater context of an older government uh, and, and society that, that uh, it, it couldn't flourish in. And who knows when that breaking point happened, right? So he holds it together and then we get this opening up and this freedom in the country. And the funny thing is, it's like in in Burmese culture, uh, a freedom doesn't necessarily guarantee ingenuity and creativity, because people are, are are they're taught to just follow, right? So, so the interesting thing about Seado is is his courage, right? So he holds it together. But the first thing that happened is like the point I was trying to make there is the the reporters that were coming are also just used to reporting about monasteries in a very set way. And there's not a whole lot of variety. Uh, you've covered some of the variety within the kind of the normal spectrum of, of Burmese monasteries. And, it, you know, so they just 
a lot of them, even with the freedom, didn't know how to report uh, about what they were doing. It's like, you know, trying to fit a, a round peg into a square hole. It just doesn't fit. But they still just do it the old way. And it, it, so it didn't really catch on. It took, it took a particular type of person, a reporter, that used the freedom to actually go and actually see what's going on and write about it. And then write about it, then he was going to be going outside of the lines of the traditional way of reporting. But it was that that allowed like better information about what they were doing and how incredible it was uh, to get out. Uh, and so that that's that's that piece within the freedom that and, and just this kind of chance that there was someone amongst the reporters that could do mm -hmm. that. And of course, once one person right. does it and it works out, it'll, it gives the freedom for other people to to report that way as well. So then, mm. you know, then they can get more reporting from more sources about what they're actually doing. So right. yeah, that piece, the courage, you know, the courage of Sada and the courage of this reporter, you know, they're, they're, they're similar type of people. And it's such a rarity in Myanmar. Yeah, and I think that's another point to really drive home is that, um, and it, it, it's also something I didn't quite grasp in the moment of interviewing him when he, he, you know, there's some consistency, some consistent themes through, that he explores throughout his 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 lay life and then and then his mission here, and one of those themes, as you mentioned, is this the ability to think critically outside the box and to to go his own way. So whether he's going his own way and in wanting to and not doing the family business that his parents want or whether it's going his own way and setting out and being an entrepreneur in an extremely difficult um, economic environment um, or, <clears throat> excuse me, whether he's doing his, his own thing in the meditation mission he's doing, um, actually even before that, doing his own way in the, uh, the meditation that he's learning and, and how... Um, how diverse and uh, and interested he is in the, the the different practices he's doing. That this is really something that that defines him. And you know, someone that doesn't have as much uh, background in Myanmar might think, okay, well, this is uh, this is his personality, and th this is this is kind of what his what his character is like, and that's all true. But I think what you're missing when you don't know about contemporary Myanmar is how unusual this is, and how much this is a s society that is, um, you know, due to its past history is. Uh, kind of learning and doing as the people did before you and without a lot of thought into um, what it is that's coming your way, you're just kind of copying that and and carrying it on further. And I think that that's something really valuable to drive home is that is uh, is that this is not just an example of his character, but this character happening in this environment makes it all the more just extremely unusual and unique. Right. So when you go to the monastery and see what's going on, and if there's any question, like, well, how did he get here? That's how it got there. It, this is part of his character. It's like you said, it's been there throughout his life. He's unique in that culture, a pioneer. You know, like he he goes around corners and doesn't know how things are going to work out. Whether that's, mm -hmm. you know, whether that's you know, in the monastery, of course. But like you know, back to his business, he he wanted to try things in new ways. You know, he was he ran his shop differently than other shops are run. Hmm. He approached, and people do that with Dhamma, like you said, they're right, they they show up, and, and most people will just show up, learn, if they like it, they just stick with that, right, but he was actually taking good things out of that, but then also trying other teachers that people might have recommended or were popular, and really kind of gathering more and more within himself, but also, you know, with this ability to kind of put it together in his own package, and then still move with it as he moves with his project in a way that met what was arising to him, which was people in great need showing up. And he just decided to flow with that. Mm. And that takes incredible. So, you know, this is where this, this is the foundation of where it starts where this faith, you know, faith in the, the serving, you know, serving people as a community, you know, together, this is, uh, yeah, that that's it. it it's kind of woven into him to be one of these uh, entrepreneurial isn't quite the right word, but these pioneers, the people mm. willing to kind of strike out in new ways and they may not get it perfect. So yeah, there's going to be a lot of criticism, but you know, he's doing a lot of good in the world. So I just really appreciate that. And it's, but it's not just this kind of planned thing. It's, it's this willing to take these risks and do something new. It's such a rarity, like you said. 
Yeah, and when, whenever anyone does something new, it's it's so easy to criticize, and it's especially easy to criticize when they do something new, and it's not quite working, or it has certain kind of problems. It's it's um, you know, it's just the natural human tendency to want to point out why it shouldn't be done this way because it hasn't in the past, and why it's not working, and it can't work because there's certain problems that are that are taking place. And so I think that you know he he definitely opens himself up to that, but he, you know, he's he's very courageous in his convictions, but he's also very open minded to hear what others have to say and 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 change his mind um, based on new knowledge coming in. And that's the other thing that I see, you know, it's great to be able to step away, to have these talks and then step away from them and reflect on it and see certain themes you don't notice at the time when they're actually happening. Because just as, as you've mentioned this theme about, um, his critical capacity, making him an outlier in a society where everyone is just trained to do things the way everyone else has done before them and not want to stand out. You know, another theme that I saw in there was just his his unadulterated love of wisdom throughout his life, love of learning, you know, and uh, it, it's very interesting because he, he, when I asked him if he had an interest in Dhamma from his beginning, as many, you know, many great teachers, when you talk to them, it's like, well, you know, from their early years, they just, they, they, they showed strong spiritual prowess. And, you know, with him, actually, that wasn't the case. You know, he says openly that, you know, no, I, I saw, real, I, I wanted, I love learning. I wanted to learn anything I could. You know, I got, he got denied going to continue his education because, of his Chinese ancestry, that he didn't have um, the proper um, the proper birthright to be able to, to to study what he wanted, but he just kept reading by himself. But he didn't see religion as part of that real learning that he wanted to take on. And then he went into business and he learned everything he could about how to make a su- successful business in a very difficult economic time in Myanmar. But he made it successful at a cost of extreme stress uh, in his life. And that was what led him to... Um, being open to the Dhamma and to seeing the power this could have to um, um, to work on some of these these mental breakdowns he was having at a cost to his business. And then once he opened himself to that Dhamma wisdom that before he hadn't been interested in because he hadn't seen it as something that was fulfilling his his hunger for learning, well, then he wanted to know everything. And then he, you know, he, he, he just wanted to take all the wisdom that his country had to offer, which is, you know, quite a bit of Dhamma wisdom here. Uh, and and was really applying himself to different kinds of teachers and practices. and But this wasn't being done in kind of a slapshot way of just throwing everything up and see what it sticks and running here and running there. Uh, you know, when you talk to him about the Mogok and um, Tayangu and Goenka practices he did, he was very clearly able to say, you know, this is these are the tools and benefits I derive from this type of teaching. So it was a very, very constructed, compartmentalized uh, system for wanting to gain this Dhamma wisdom, and which also characterizes him as a teacher. And, uh, you know, to, to, and just thinking about his, his love of, his lifelong love of learning and openness, I can't help but think of another great Burmese monk, which is Lady Sayada of the 19th century. Um, you know, Lady also was characterized by, by just a voracious reader who wanted to know everything and wasn't threatened by any knowledge. You know, he wanted to know, he wanted to know Western, um, the Western knowledge that was coming at the time, the, the new, uh, new Western technology, the new studies on biology. Uh, he wasn't, uh, he wanted to teach everyone. He wanted to teach foreigners as well as, as locals and, and monastic and lay and males as well as females. So, you know, this love of learning that animated Lady, uh, Lady Seda throughout his life and really made him stand out from the monks of his day as well as the monks that followed. I think that's that's also just a singular love of learning and openness and flexibility that you see in Thabawa Seda as well. And I in no mean, uh, I in no mean intend to compare Thabawa's life and teachings and mission with ladies because they're very different monks living in a very different time. And Thabawa is just starting his own out. Um, but this is one characteristic that I really have not seen in many other uh, meditation teachers or monks or even people that um, that I find is something that binds them, just this this unadulterated love of learning in any form that it takes and really not feeling threatened by that learning and always wanting more and then incorporating that into your practice and then how you go and, you know, into your teaching as you go out with it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, he one thing about that, that uh, that wisdom that What's interesting, I think, by the time he got to uh, being interested in the Dhamma, his mind had already gathered the type of wisdom that brings a type of mental maturity that, you know, a lot of us that when we start uh, meditation, I mean, I I would argue that I certainly didn't have at the time. I was more like a Dhamma child, you know, or he Mm kind of comes in more like 
a teenager, you know, and a healthy teenager right. isn't a child. They need to explore a little more, make some decisions on their own, uh, and and use some of the experience that they have and learn. Right, and he had already done some of that already. So by the time he gets to Dhamma, he's he's there's actually a type of mental maturity and to use that wisdom and to grow it and to to kind of focus on 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 wisdom. This wisdom actually then manifests in in everything he does. So so as he comes to his project, you know, it, it didn't start off like I'm gonna do this project, but as things are unfolding, I'd said before that everything you know Tabawa it, the heart of it is this serving others as a community right and yeah. it is deeply informed by this wisdom and this wisdom isn't just knowledge it's actually understanding how faith actually works so it's not a blind faith at all how service works and certainly we haven't mentioned this yet but, you know his wisdom was just how powerful awareness is so I would say three things together, even though we call the heart of it at the Bala, the, the serving others as a community together, right? So, but that is deeply informed by wisdom, and that is the essential ingredient in order to be able to do that effectively is to carry awareness throughout the whole process. And then so these three things together are uh, they're really the whole package, and this is a manifestation, a living manifestation of of the the wisdom he he continues to gather throughout his experience because i tell you like to do it any other way well let me let me rephrase that to the the true mark of 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 someone's practice is how it actually manifests faith is actually rather more like confidence right so he has a confidence in in the serving of others with awareness and that confidence is what what gives the whole thing strength it's it's the confidence that holds the whole thing together because a, a, an unwise mind without confidence when things aren't quite working out <laughs> and if you go to the Tabawa center it thing it seems at times there's a lot of things not quite working out oh like and the mind out of fear wants to jump in and like fix it in a very kind of clear and you know we got to do it like this and and it just doesn't work like that there and going back to our friend who visited there and myself and and the way you felt as well that unsettling that we feel sometimes is is that this place is not a manifestation of fear-based control it's actually mm, a manifestation I, yeah. of of freedom freedom yeah. A skillful Absolutely. freedom, right? So skillful is important. It's a wise freedom. And and I think, so no matter what we want to say about the whole thing, the criticisms that people have, I think it's hard to say that it's wrong. It's, it's He's pioneered something new. He's, he's, he's turned a corner that hasn't been turned before. You know, people criticize sometimes monsters for not doing enough for others. And maybe he didn't get it 100% right. But I think he's I think the whole place is doing something incredibly awesome in a way that may be uncomfortable. If we spend any amount of time there and we can manifest any of that faith in just doing good things and with, with skill, with awareness, then we've gained something. And it, the Baba can give that to us. I think that's beautiful. Yeah. And I think that, you know, you really get into this thing of, um, into discussing, you know, what what it actually his teachings are, um, you know, what what his uh, what kind of meditation he teaches, what is uh, how he characterizes Dhamma practice. And this is obviously something that we didn't explore in this interview because we were really just taking a long, patient time to learn about who he was, where he came from and how he got to where he's going, which I think was really valuable because, you know, we see certain themes develop and see certain decisions he made that that in understanding that we're able to look ahead at what what is actually happening now with the mission that um, that we're able to refer back to and gain a deeper understanding but I think that it, it does have to be said that there there is a methodology behind the Dhamma practice and 
the um, um, the way that he holds the instructions, the way that he that he holds it all together and brings it together with his teachings on awareness and non attachment, really being detached and mindfulness that we haven't had a chance to explore yet during this interview, but during the next one, that's the you know the next topic we'll get into and really try to understand uh, how those teachings bring everything together. So we have that to look forward to. Absolutely. I look forward to it yeah. as well. Yeah, great. Well, um, then thanks for your time and uh, check back in with you uh, next time we talk to Tabawa and uh, hope they don't do too much more burning out there. <laughs> All right. I don't think that's going to stop, but, it, but uh, I'll take the, the wishes. Maybe the wish will blow some of the, the smoke. Well, I don't want to blow it to anyone else either, but yeah, anyways, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, great. Okay, we'll catch you later. All right, take care, bud. Greetings from Yangon, and we hope you enjoy this episode from the Insight Myanmar podcast. Although we've completed over a dozen interviews so far, this is the first release of a full-length episode as our team has been finalizing our overall podcast format and structure. From here on out, we hope to produce about a podcast a week. In this podcast series, we hope to illuminate the depth and the breadth of Dhamma practice in Myanmar. Many from the diverse range of speakers initially became known to us, in our work creating a meditator's guidebook to the country. And it's really a privilege to be able to bring their own voices directly into your earbuds. All these guests that you'll be hearing from have one thing in common, a deep commitment to integrating the Buddhist teachings of liberation into their lives and developing in wisdom. We hope that the diversity of their individual paths may not just educate, but also inspire listeners, as they certainly have done for all of us here. The Insight Myanmar podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts and is also playable directly from our website, www.insightmyanmar.captivate.fm. I know for a lot of podcast listeners, as soon as the fundraising requests start up, you kind of just zone out or skip ahead until it's over. But I ask that if you're taking the time to listen to our full podcast, that you also take the time to consider our spiel. Some may assume that producing a 90-minute episode wouldn't take much more time than the conversation itself, but there's so much more that goes into it. Several days in advance, our content team reviews the biography and any works of the upcoming guest and discusses the best way to use our limited time together. Our logistic department coordinates transportation for the guest to the studio, And then after the interview, the raw audio file is sent to our sound engineer. One 90-minute episode can take him up to two days of solid work, which is carefully coordinated with our content team to ensure smooth listening. More work is then done recording the introduction of the guest and other segments, particularly the post-interview reflection, and then mixing them back together to upload to the hosting site, delivering the podcast that our listeners eventually hear. We hope each one provides you a solid hour plus of inspirational and informative Dhamma content. And if so, we also hope that you can consider supporting our mission. You have been listening to the Insight Myanmar podcast. We invite you to rate, review, and share our podcast as every little bit of feedback helps. You can also subscribe to the Insight Myanmar podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Additionally, you can listen and download right off the web at www.insightmyanmar.captivate.fm. That's www.insightmyanmar, one word, I-N-S-I-G-H-T-M-Y-A-N-M-A-R dot captivate, C-A-P-T-I-V-A-T-E dot F-M. If you cannot find our feed on your podcast player, please let us know and we will ensure it can be offered there. There was certainly a lot to talk about in this episode, and we'd like to encourage listeners to keep the discussion going. Make a post, suggest a guest, request specific questions, and join in on discussions on our Insight Myanmar podcast Facebook group. And also welcome to join our Facebook and Instagram accounts by the same name, Insight Myanmar. If you're not on Facebook, you can also message us directly at burmadama at gmail.com. That's B-U-R-M-A-D-H-A-M-M-A at gmail.com. Or if you'd like to start up a discussion group on another platform, let us know and we can share that forum. We would also like to take this time to thank everyone who made this podcast possible, especially our two sound engineers, Martin Combs and Tharnge, along with Zach Hessler, content collaborator and part-time co-host, and Ken Pransky, who helps with editing.
We'd also like to thank everyone who assisted us in bringing the guests who have made up the show so far, as well as the guests themselves, for agreeing to come and share their stories. Finally, we're immensely grateful to the donors who made this entire thing possible in the first place. We also remind our listeners that the opinions expressed by our guests are their own and not necessarily reflective of the host or other podcast contributors. If you find the Dhamma interviews we are sharing of value and would like to support our mission, we welcome your contribution. You may give monthly donations at Patreon at www.patreon.com slash InsightMyanmar or one-time donations on PayPal at www.paypal.me slash InsightMyanmar. In both cases, that's Insight Myanmar, one word. If you are in Myanmar and would like to give a cash donation, please feel free to get in touch with us.